We are still in our series called Love Rediscovered. And there's a reason why we have been and will be for the next few Sundays still in this series called Love Rediscovered. And the reason is there are many people in this world who think they know what love is, but they're completely wrong. On the other hand, there are many people in this world who have no clue uh, what real love is. The only way we can know what real love is is when we rediscover it according to its author. The author of love, the inventor of love, was not some romantic songwriter in, you know, in ages past. The author of love is God. As a matter of fact, in his word, the Bible, it doesn't only tell us that God is loving. It does tell us that. But it also tells us that God is love. It's his nature. And so if there's anyone who can teach us about what real love is so that we can rediscover it for ourselves, it's the author of this book. Okay, so are we clear so far why we're talking about love rediscovered? Now, in the last few weeks, it's almost as if we were interviewing subject matter as experts about the topic of love. For example, um, we interviewed, so to speak, as we looked into their life and into their words, we first interviewed Jesus, love rediscovered according to Jesus. And when Pastor Peter shared with us uh, the message three weeks ago, it was really all about the why. Why should we love the way the Bible teaches us to love? And the reason is, Jesus, the reason Jesus gave is that because God's people will not be known, will not be evident by how much Bible we know, although it's important to know the Bible. It's not by how many ministries we serve in, but it's important to serve in ministry. But he said, all men will know you're my disciples. Fill in the blanks. By the way you love one another. And so that was the why. Christians should and will be known by their love. And then the next two Sundays, there was a lot of how. We interviewed, as it were, the Apostle Paul who talked, uh, taught us that love is action. Patient, kind, not boastful, not arrogant, not keeping a record of wrongs and all of these things. Very down to earth, very practical, but also very impossible to implement consistently apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, last Sunday, through Pastor Edric, we interviewed uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who taught us about radical love. And when you, uh, when you and I hear the word radical, one of the synonyms that comes to our mind is extreme, right? When somebody is radical, he is also extreme. And that just tells us that these, these just represent the nature of God's love for us. God is known by his love. God's love is, God is love in action. The word agape, which many of you have heard many times, one of, the implications of its, one of the implications of its meaning is that it's love translated into action. So God's love is action. And God's love is radical. So we're going to the right source. So again... Why is it so important for us to rediscover love according to its author? Okay, how many of you were already alive in 1967 and honest enough to admit it? Okay, we have a few. Yeah, great. Um, this will probably have more hands raised. So regardless of when you were born, how many of you remember the Beatles? Okay, so we have, yeah, like you're saying, yeah, my grandfather told me about them. Okay, whatever. But in 1967, the Beatles released a single. You still know what a single means? Okay, they, they released a song called All You Need Is Love. And amazingly, now remember, this was 1967. Amazingly, they performed it live in a studio and it was televised by satellite to 25 countries and was viewed by 400 million people. Not bad for 1967 
technology. But what was the reason behind all of this? Why did they write this song? And why, is, why was it so important for all of the world to hear it? I'll, I'll explain to you. First of all, if you remember the song, All You Need Is Love, you remember the chorus is extremely simple. The chorus is, all you need is love. All you need is love. All you need is love. 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 Love is all you need. Ang kulit, ano? Why did they write it that way? So simple. Because they wanted even the non-English speaking people of the world to understand it. Now, why did they want even the non-English speaking of the people of the world to understand it? It has to do with what was going on in the world at the time. The Vietnam War, the Cold War, and even the Six-Day Arab-Israeli War. In other words, there was so much strife, tension, division, anger in the world in 1967 or thereabouts. Do you think much has changed since then in this world? Not much. As a matter of fact, if anything at all, things are probably worse today than they were at that time. Which means the world needs to hear a simple love song that people from every nation and language can understand. Do you know what the most beautiful love song in the world is? It's the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have, say it with me, everlasting life. That is the most beautiful, simplest, and yet the most profound love song in the universe. It will always be that. Now, I'd like to introduce to you this afternoon our interviewee. From whom are we going to learn about love rediscovered this afternoon? Well, it's this man. Can you guess who that is? Do you recognize him? We don't really know what Peter looked like, but based on the fish on the net, in the net, we know that this is the Apostle Peter. Actually, when you read, he, he wrote two epistles, so we're going to learn uh, from what he said about love, but we'll also learn about his life, how he experienced, how he rediscovered love for himself. And so, as a backgrounder, I'd like us to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, the first of two letters he wrote, and he's saying, Peter, introducing himself as the author and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia who are chosen. So the apostle Peter is now trying to set the mindset of the reader. His readers, obviously, are followers of Jesus. And they are followers of Jesus who are scattered all over the world primarily because of persecution. And we know that with persecution comes oppression, and with persecution comes marginalization, and uh, even poverty because people won't give you a job because you're a Christian, etc., etc. So he's reminding people that we are aliens. This world is not our home. How many of you believe that? This world is not our home. And then he says, we are aliens and we are privileged despite our suffering because we are chosen by God, sovereignly chosen, adopted into his family. And then he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, why are we chosen? Why did he choose us? Why did he take us out of this world, which is the, the meaning of the word church, right? Ecclesia, to be called out of this world. For what purpose? He says, to obey Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's setting our mind on the right path, which is exactly what he's doing, even for you and me today who are here in the auditorium or who, or who are watching online. So, Peter said, you and I are aliens, 
We're chosen for a purpose, and that is to obey Jesus. And what is one specific way that he says you and I should be obeying Jesus? Let me jump a few chapters. By the way, this is our memory verse for this week. 1 Peter 4, 8. Let's all read this together. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Now, when you see the words above all, what does that imply? It's like, this is the most important thing in everything I'm telling you. This is top of the list, right? This is number one priority. And what is his number one priority? He says, keep fervent in your love for one another. I don't recall any other writer using uh, this word. And even if Peter does not mention love, the word, in uh, many occasions in his letters, but what he does mention about it is very important. When, as we go through the letters of Peter, you and I will not so much be looking at how, but we'll be going back to why. Why are we to love the way God wants us to love? Why are we to keep fervent in our love for one another? That's what we'll discover together. By the way, the word fervent uh, means earnest, meaning there's a sense of urgency, zealous, stretched to its maximum potential. The word picture for the word uh, fervent in the original language, the word picture is something like this. It's athletes, you know, like runners in a race, four by four, whatever it is that you're familiar with, straining to win, straining to reach the finish line, straining to complete the race. And you, you and I can, can see how the, the muscles of these athletes are literally strained to the limit because they know that they must finish that race. And so our message today, based on 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, is very simply, love fervently. Shall we say that together? Love fervently. Tell the person next to you, even at home watching online, love fervently. You know, the word fervent or fervently is not a word uh, we often use nowadays. So we're going to learn more about what it means. But more importantly, why we should love fervently. Why we should love to the limit. Why we should stretch through the power of the Holy Spirit our ability, our willingness, and our application of love towards one another and towards other people. If we read the, uh, the letters of Peter, he gives us three reasons why we should love fervently. Number one reason is new identity. He reminds his readers, as he reminds all of us who claim to be followers of Jesus, we are new people in Christ. We are no longer who we used to be. Number two reason to love fervently is short time. How many of you believe life is short? Yeah, I think we all do. It's never too long, right? And the third reason to love fervently is genuine forgiveness. You and I have experienced it. Other people need to experience it. Those are the three reasons, at least, maybe you can find more as you read First and Second Peter on your own time, but these are three things the Apostle Peter puts forward. So let's begin with the first one. We should love fervently because of our new identity. What does that mean? In ver chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Okay, so he, here we see the second mention of the word fervent or fervently. So he's saying... Since you have already committed yourself to obey Jesus, and this has a purifying effect on your soul, on your motives, your words, your thoughts, your actions, he said, therefore, fervently love one another from the heart. So in other words, uh, this obedience, again, just like, what, like he was saying earlier, uh, this obedience that we render unto Jesus 
should be expressed specifically in fervent love for one another. But again, we're talking about the reason why. And in verse 23, he tells us the reason. Remember, the first point is new identity. He says, for you have been, what did he say? Born again. You know, some people are allergic to the term born again. They think born again is the name of a group. They think born again is um, the label of a church. But born again actually, well, let's just say this. It's so absolutely essential for a person to be born again. And we will see later on why it is something that must happen for a person to experience God's fervent love for himself or for himself. But in the meantime, he says, you love one another fervently because you are a new person in Christ. You have been spiritually reborn. That's what it means. God did not just give you a makeover. You know those TV shows where they try to make somebody feel good and they buy her nice clothes and put makeup and hairdo and then she comes out from the curtain and says, how do I look? Nice try, right? But the change is on the outside. When God works on you and you are born again, the change is from the inside out. You may look at the mirror and you may look the same. But as, to begin, as you begin to live your new life in Christ, you and the people around you will see the change. I remember when I had first given my life to Jesus and I was walking around the office and finally some people had the guts to ask me a question. They said, how come you don't tell us dirty jokes anymore? And you know what? I never noticed, I stopped. It was only when that guy told me or asked me, and I said, oh, you're right. I have stopped doing that. Why? Because I got born again. That's what born again means. So people have all kinds of, you know, ways to call it burn again or born against because they don't understand what it means. But here, the Apostle Paul, just to kind of digress for a bit, the Apostle Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, meaning in a relationship with him, it's not about being a member of a church or joining a group. It's about being in a relationship with Christ. If that is genuine, it says, you are now a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. The goal of the Christian life, the goal of God and Jesus in our Christian life is not just to make us slightly nicer people than we were yesterday. Although that's a good thing to do because then we grow more and more into Christ's likeness. But his goal is to make us an entirely new person. Positionally, he makes us new. And as we live each day, we grow into that newness, that's that new pattern of life that he's given to us. By the way, this word new, he is a new creature. The word new, it's, it means fresh, unused, unprecedented, unheard of. In other words, it's nothing like what the world can offer, world can offer. And as I was, you know, looking at this fresh, unused, you know what I was thinking of? How many of you, you like the smell of a new car? Even if it's not yours. <laughs> Okay, you like, have you ever smelled the smell of a new car? Like you, somebody picked you up and you say, wow, this is a new car. Then you go in and it's like, there's no other smell like the smell of a new car. Or you go to the, the what do you call this, the, the showroom, right? And, and you pretend like you're buying a car. <laughs> and then you just sit in one and it's like, wow, the smell of a new car. And you know, I, sometimes I wonder, why don't they invent a cologne or a perfume? New car perfume. You, can you imagine Then you spray yourself and then when you go past people, they say, oh, he must have a new car. <laughs> but that's, that's what it means. New, absolutely, totally, completely new. How critical is this? I mentioned earlier. It's not just a nice thing to have. You know, some people say, oh, I'm going to join this born-again group because it's kind of fashionable, you know, nowadays. Ah, it's a matter of life and death. 
What do I mean? One night, a Pharisee named Nicodemus went to Jesus. And Jesus looked him in the eye, although that's not written in the gospel, but I'm pretty sure he did that. Jesus looked at him and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. My friend, if you want to be in heaven someday, and I'm sure in your heart of hearts that's what you want to do. Even if you say, I'm not sure I even believe in heaven or hell. Yeah, okay. But you know what? When you know that your time on earth is nearing its end, you will hope that there is a heaven. And I tell you, Jesus said, Unless you're born again, you will not see heaven. You will not see the kingdom of God. And by his grace, he's letting all of us know what is the secret of being assured of being in heaven someday. And that is allowing Jesus to grant us that spiritual rebirth, that new identity in him. Are we together so far? Okay. So let's go back to Peter. Chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, this doesn't mean that a Christian never sins. What it's saying is, remember, it's the backdrop is persecution. That was the, the biggest challenge of believers during that time. And so he's saying, if you are suffering today because of your faith, then you are on the right track, painful as it may be. And as you continue to obey Jesus, even if you're suffering, you will continue to love him more, please him more, and you will sin less and less. And then he says in verse 2, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. So he's reminding you and me today as he was reminding his readers back then. Our purpose as new people in Jesus, even in the midst of suffering, remember what the first point of Pastor Edric last week is to love God in the midst of suffering. He says our goal in life now until the end is to do the will of God. How many of us today can honestly stand before God and say, Lord, my purpose in life today is nothing more and nothing less than to do your will. Can we honestly say that? Or are there days when we say, Lord, your will, MWF, my will, TTHS. And then Sunday, I come to worship. No can do. We are new people in Christ. And then he goes on to say this. For the time already passed is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. Having pursued the course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking, parties, and abominable idolatries. In simple English, Peter is saying, reminding his Christian audience. He's saying... Folks, why should we live out our new identity in Christ? Because you already had more than enough time for the idiotic, self-centered life you used to live before. That's enough. That's in the past. Leave it there. Don't pick it up again. Live for the will of God. Now, what difference does it make when a follower of Jesus says, I'm going to live out my new identity in Christ for his glory, for his pleasure. What impact does it make? Do you sometimes get discouraged and say, you know, sometimes obeying God is a problem. It gets me into trouble or, you know, there's a real downside to it and so forth. And so sometimes we'd like to take a vacation from being a Christian and say, Lord, just in this instance... Can I just do what the world does and then go back to my new identity tomorrow? My friend, living according to our newness in Christ should never be a source of regret. You'll never know how God will use your simple obedience to impact somebody else. For example, 
Let me give you the story of two young professionals. This is not them. This is just a, a picture to represent the story I'm about to share with you. Many years ago, there were these two uh, young professionals working in a multinational bank. Okay, two of them, very young at the time. One was a subordinate, the other was a boss. The subordinate was a new follower of Jesus, not with CCF, another church. The boss was not a follower of Jesus. The boss would always tell dirty jokes, something like me before. He would always tell dirty jokes in the office. Everybody would laugh. I don't know if it's because it was really funny or because they were, how do you say make sip sip in English? Anyway, you know what I mean. They were, everybody was laughing, except the subordinate who was a new follower of Jesus. He wasn't doing it because he wanted to make himself look self-righteous. He just wanted to please Jesus. He knew that he was a new person, no longer wanting to do the old stuff. One day, subordinate, new Christian, goes into the office of boss, non-Christian, shares the gospel with a boss. The boss does not accept. They part ways eventually. Many years later, I think at least 15 years after, they meet again. The subordinate, the former subordinate, who was a new Christian 15 or more years ago, is now a pastor in his church. Wow. The former boss, to his delight when they met again, not only is the former boss was already a Christian, he was also a pastor in CCF. Isn't that amazing? But wait, 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 wait. Save it, save it, save it. So they talk and they compare notes. And then the boss tells this guy, you know what? You were the first person to ever share the gospel with me. I did not accept. But you know what impacted me about you? You never laughed at my jokes. I never forgot your example. Praise God. Now we can give the Lord the glory. You'll never know. You'll never know how our simple daily obedience can impact people for Jesus. Okay, so let's continue. Second Peter. Grace and peace will multiply to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted, uh, granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So here Peter is going to tell us the first of two things. Why and how we can live that new life in Christ. The first thing Peter says is you have the power. Not in yourself, but in the Holy Spirit. He says, his divine, God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. The power to live the Christian life is within us, not by self-will, but by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we have no excuse not to live that new life in Christ. We also have all the means, he says, everything pertaining to life and godliness. So Peter is saying, reminding his readers, reminding us, reminding you online, we have the power to live the Christian life. It comes from God. The second thing he says is we also have the promises of God. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How many of you are grateful for the promises of God today? How many of you have been in a situation in your life where the, that was so desperate, so difficult, and so dark 
that the only thing you had to hold on to were the promises of God. Have you ever been there? Look at all of the hands around the room. It's amazing. No wonder Peter describes these promises as what? Precious and magnificent. So we have every reason, every means, every inspiration to live out that new identity in Christ. In the first centuries of the Roman Empire, there were several plagues that hit the empire, more than one. And always, whenever a plague hit the Roman Empire, you could see the difference in behavior between the Christians and the, the pagans, I guess. The Roman government officials, even their doctors, even their doctors ran away. They fled from the plague. Who stayed? Well, those who were too sick to go anywhere. And the Christians. They stayed behind. In one particular plague, which they suspected was smallpox, it wiped out one-fourth to one-third of the Roman Empire. In another plague, but still the Christians behaved the same way. In yet another plague, you have this quotation from Dionysius, the, um, the bishop of Alexandria. He was describing what the Christians were doing. Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. You, you get what he's saying? It's incredible. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. No wonder when the world witnessed this, it helped draw people to want to know the Jesus that these people knew. At the most dangerous time of our pandemic, this was the Delta variant. You remember those dark days? Regardless of what you believe about vaccine, there was no vaccine. People didn't want to get out of their house. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't because you needed a pass. Uh, every, every day you'd get texts, pray for my brother, my mother, my sister. She's in the hospital. She'll be intubated. When you heard intubated, it's like a death sentence. You remember those days? It's like people were afraid to even say something because they might, you know, catch something from somebody else. Well, the day came, as I told you a few times before, that I got infected myself. This was about the same time my wife got infected and went to be with Jesus. But I remember when, I, when people learned that I got infected, um, I got calls from at least two people from CCF. Now, remember... This was a time when nobody wanted to be with anybody. Fear gripped the entire nation and the world. And yet these two men told me, I'm willing to drive you to the hospital. You just tell me. These two men were both married with very young children. And yet despite the danger to themselves, they told me, you just say the word, I'll go to your house. I will drive you to the hospital. You know what, folks? If I was not a Christian then, and they told me that, I would say, I want to know your Jesus. So the question is, when people observe our life, do they see fervent love? Do they see fervent love such that they will even in the silence of their minds, say, I want to know your Jesus. We love fervently because we have a new identity in Christ, but also because time is short. Where does Peter tell us about that? Second Peter chapter 1, he says, Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you. 
I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. What is Peter saying here? When he says, as long as I am in this earthly dwelling, his earthly dwelling is the physical body, right? So he's saying simply, as long as I have breath, as long as I'm alive, I will keep reminding you. That's my ministry to you. I will keep reminding you to live for Jesus, that you are new people in Christ, that you don't belong to this earth, that heaven is your home, etc., etc. For as long as I have breath in my lungs, I will always stir you up, which means to wake you up by way of reminder. Now, why was Peter so committed to do this? Because he said, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent. He knew that with every day and every year that passed, he was drawing closer and closer to his last day on earth. He knew that. As also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. That is how Peter first realized that life is short. I'll show it to you later. And I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. In other words, I am so committed to exhorting you, to reminding you while I'm alive, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be so makulit that even after I die, you will still hear my voice in your head reminding you about the need to live for Jesus. And he said, our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear to me When did that happen? If you read John 21, Jesus told Peter, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this, he said, signifying by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And when he, Jesus, had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. From the beginning, Peter knew life was short. He was probably in his 20s or maybe early 30s when he was following Jesus at the start. He was martyred in 68 AD, which maybe put him in his late 80s. But for every day that Peter lived, He had one command ringing in his head, and that was, follow me. Don't waste your life. You follow me. And he knew that from every day that passed, he was not getting any younger. He was getting older. But it's not only his life that he knew was short. Peter knew that this earth, this world was not going to last forever. So this is the other aspect of time being short. Peter wrote, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. You know, when we hear about what's happening in this world, It's easy to panic. It's easy to be critical. It's easy to fall on either the pro or the anti side of the political spectrum. Or even when things happen in our private world. It's easy to panic, to doubt, to be fearful. I know, it happens to me a lot. That's why Peter is saying, be of sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Let communion with God put peace in your heart. And then, our memory verse. Above all, imagine after everything that he said, above all, keep fervent in your love for one another. So being fervent in our love for one another carries a sense of urgency. Because even Peter said, again jumping back to 2 Peter, He says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. By the way, have you ever experienced somebody stealing something from you? Did somebody snatch your bag? Or did somebody break into your house? Or maybe steal your car? You know, 
when these things happen, you don't get somebody calling for an appointment. Um, Ma'am, good evening po. Uh, by 2.30 a.m. tomorrow, I'll be there. I'll be there to take your TV and your cell phones. Please prepare coffee for me. It's no such thing. He's a thief. The element of surprise is in his favor. Now, Jesus said, yeah, there are many signs. Matthew 24 t- tells us a lot about the signs of the times. But Jesus said, even he does not know the exact day or hour. And that's why he says, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. What's going to happen? The heavens will pass away with a roar. The elements will be destroyed with intense heat. And the earth and its works will be burned up. Why does this have to be so cataclysmic? I'll tell you. No, I won't tell you. Peter will tell you. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this manner, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Okay, the first thing he says, time is short. Not only your life, not only my life, the life of this earth is short. How should we behave therefore? Other people will say, let's party. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow the world will end. But Peter says, no, you're a new person in Christ. When we know time is short, we respond differently. He says, we ought to be in holy conduct and godliness. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens, again, he says, will be destroyed by burning. The elements will melt with intense heat. Why? This is the amazing part. Verse 13. Can we read this all together now? But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. How many of you are looking forward to your real home? Hallelujah. It could be tomorrow. We don't know. But as that song goes, I have a home in glory land that outshines the sun. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Time is short. How does that translate into fervent love? And why do I have motorcycle wheels on the (laughs) the screen? I'd like to show you how one person acts on this with a sense of urgency, with a fervent love to help people know Jesus in a very unique way. Let's watch this video together. Hindi ma'am, nagsishare kasi ako ng Bible verse sa mga pasayro. Okay lang ba ma'am? Kuya! Diyan 3.16 lang ma'am, kung narinig nyo na yun? Narinig, uh-huh. narinig nyo na? Uh-huh. Before God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that, that whoever believes in Him, shall not perish but have eternal life. As we are, inibig niya tayo kahit may mga pagkakamali tayo, pagkukulang, imperfection, inibig niya tayo lahat. Ayaw niya tayong mapahamak or maperish sa impyerno. Impyerno kasi yun, mami. Bakit tayo mapapahamak? Gawa ng... May kilala ka ba, mam, na walang kasalanan? Wala. Wala. Lahat tayo meron. Kahit ako lang, eh. Kahit sabi mo nang sasalita ako, salita ng Diyos, eh. Daan ako ng daan sa bike lane. <laughs> Kulit ko, eh. Pero may good news naman tayo, mga ang magandang balita ron, yun nga, ibinigay niya yung kanyang bugtong na anak that he gave, so libigatin sa Sino ba yung nag-iisang anak, ma'am, ng Diyos? Jesus! Jesus! Yun, thank you, ma'am. Siya yung nag- nagpakapako sa cross, namatay, para, para, para ano, para sa kasalanan natin. Kailangan natin i-receive sa buhay natin at sa puso. Do you accept Jesus Christ, ma'am, as your Lord and Savior, ma'am? Oh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Yun na, tapos na. Ayoko na. <laughs> <laughs> Biglang ganun na nasungit. Hindi pwedeng hindi, kuya. Uh, hindi pwedeng hindi. Wow, ang sarap naman ng pakinggan, ma'am. Hindi pwedeng hindi. Oh, you're here. Oh, you're yes, I have uh, intercom. Because I'm sharing a Bible verse, ma'am, to, for my every passenger. Can I share a Bible verse, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sharing John 3.16 on Holy, Bi- on Holy Bible. In Holy Bible, ma'am. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, oh. so that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. <laughs> yes, I'm sharing it for. Amazing. I hope I deliver it to you in English. 
Because my, my English mom is consumable. <laughs> uh, no, the Bible verse, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. You heard it? Yes, thank you sir, thank you sir. What did Jesus do? He died on the cross to save us from our sins. And what are we gonna do? We have to believe or we have to acknowledge His sacrifice for us to save us from our sins. And we have to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. What's your, what's your ano, sir, uh, nationality? Spanish. Spanish? Wow. So you do believe in Jesus Christ also? Not really. Not really? Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. That's my <laughs> channel, sir. Kuyaman TV. Amazing, huh? Now just to show you that that man is the real thing, he's right here. Meet Manuel and his wife, Erica. Please stand. Manuel is from CCF. He's a D-group leader. Hallelujah. God is using him in amazing ways. Pareho ka na mag-bike lane, ha? Praise God. Thank you so much. Oh, by the way, it's his birthday today. Oh, how awesome is that? But his most important birthday is when he was born again. Amen, brother? Okay, so we're down to our final reason why. Love fervently. You have a new identity in Christ. Time is short. Genuine forgiveness. We've received it. The world needs it. Again, back to our memory verse. Keep fervent in your love for one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sins. Cover does not mean to cover up. Cover means to pardon, to not take it against the person, to keep no record, to use it as a weapon, not to gossip nor slander so as to destroy another, another's reputation. That's what cover means. It basically means forgive. I shared this story many years ago. This story is about a man named Alvin Strait. He was 73 in 1994. And Alvin Strait set out on a journey to meet up with his older brother who had had a stroke. Now, why did Alvin Strait want to travel to see his brother who had had a stroke? You see, he and his brother had not spoken for 10 years because they were mad at each other. So he said, Alvin Strait said to himself, enough of this. We're not getting any younger. My brother had a stroke. I'm going to go to him and I'm going to ask for forgiveness and we're going to forgive each other and reconcile. That was his conviction. The problem was Alvin Strait uh, at his age, had very poor eyesight. So the, the, the government would not issue him a driver's license. But what he had was a lawnmower, you know, the one that you ride in, ride on, rather. And so he took the lawnmower and he hitched the wagon because he knew he would need some provisions. And the top speed of his lawnmower, top speed, five miles per hour. His brother lived 240 miles away. But he went on the journey. He completed the journey to see his brother. It took him six weeks. That's why he needed the trailer behind him. But folks, the challenge of Alvin Strait's example to us today is what are we willing to do? And how far are we willing to go? to forgive, to seek forgiveness, to be reconciled, to have genuine forgiveness. We've experienced it. We need to give it. Going back to the life of Peter, he experienced that himself. How? In Luke 22, Jesus told Peter, called him by his uh, earlier name, Simon, Simon, behold, 
Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So this was a, 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 a prophecy, if you will, that Jesus was revealing to Peter. Peter ha had no clue what Jesus was talking about. As a matter of fact, the only thing on his mind was this. He said to him, Lord, with you, I'm ready to go both to prison and to death. Jesus said, ah, yeah, right. <laughs> I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. Huh. In Peter's mind, that's unthinkable. Unthinkable. And yet, in a few hours, the unthinkable happened. After they had kindled the fire in the middle of the courtyard, had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them, and a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, This man was with him too. But he denied it, saying, Woman, don't know him. A little later, another saw him and said, You are one of them too. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And he thinks he's in the clear, right? But after an hour, <laughs> another man began to insist, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. Immediately, while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. Now, the Gospel of Luke is the only Gospel that records this particular part. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Would you like to be in Peter's situation that time? After insisting you would not deny him, and then hearing the rooster crow, all of a sudden Jesus turns and your eyes meet. I was thinking to myself, what did that look, look like? We don't know. But I think based on the character of Jesus. I do not think it was a I told you so kind of look. I don't think it was a I knew I shouldn't have chosen you to be one of the 12 kind of look. I think it was a look of love. I think it was a look of compassion. I think it was a look of hope. I think it was a look of genuine forgiveness. Because as unthinkable as Peter's denial was in his own mind, even more unthinkable was what happened not long after, when he met Jesus again. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my lambs. Remember what he told him, you, when you have turned around, you strengthen your brothers. So he was already fulfilling that. He said, tend my lambs. Said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. See, at the core of everything of this conversation is love. Not personal ambition, not wanting to prove anything about himself because he had already failed miserably. And then a third time, says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said to him, you tend my sheep. Even more unthinkable than the denial of Peter of Jesus was Jesus' reinstatement of Peter. That was genuine forgiveness. It was almost 20 years ago. I was a volunteer pastor in CCF. When I say volunteer pastor, it means uh, I had a day job, as they say. I was a, a corporate executive 
in a multinational company, but I was also a pastor in CCF, again, as I say, as a volunteer, as many pastors were and even up to this day are. But at that point in my life, it had become very clear that I was failing miserably in my leadership at home as a father. And when it became very clear to my wife and me that I was in such a dilemma and I had been failing miserably in that respect, we went to see Pastor Peter and Sister Diana at their home. Again, this was almost 20 years ago. And I told them the situation and I was told, yeah, I think it's really best that you take a break, you step down from being a pastor in CCF. And so I broke the news to my fellow pastors at that time. I broke the news to, my, to our small group. I'll save you the details. But suffice it to say that I had no illusions of ever coming back to that same role in ministry. As far as I'm concerned, if God was done with me in that sense of being a volunteer pastor, that's all right. I accept my failure. If all I'll do for the rest of my Christian life is lead my small group, I'll be happy with that. As a matter of fact, and this was way back in uh, St. Francis Square, for those of you who remember, um, I was perfectly happy giving out chronicles to the people who were coming into the worship service. I said, Lord, if that's, if that's all, I'll be happy doing that for you. I had no illusions of ever coming back and being a pastor or a shepherd. I don't know how long the time was that passed. Could have been a year or two. It was not long. But like I said, I had no expectations. And Pastor Peter came up to me one day and in typical Pastor Peter fashion, he says to me, oh, when are you ready to preach again? And it's like, you tell me. <laughs> Long story short, because of genuine forgiveness, I'm here in front of you today. So folks, who are we to be takers of genuine forgiveness and not be givers? And so as we wind up our time together, we love fervently because we have a new identity because time is short, and because we have received and must give genuine forgiveness. I want us now, as we end, to listen to a story. Chris and Lisa Flores, will you come forward, please? Let's welcome them. I want you to hear their story and how it ties everything together. Okay? Chris, Lisa, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. At the age of 12, I already had the opportunity of knowing Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior through my mom who was already a Christian. In my heart, I had a personal relationship with Jesus and I actively served and volunteered in different ministries in a small Christian church. I, on the other hand, attended a traditional school and despite being required to attend church, I grew up not knowing Jesus and did not have a personal relationship with him. When I met Chris, I knew that he was not a Christian. And despite the Bible's warnings against being in a relationship with an unbeliever, I entertained these advances. We eventually started dating and had an intimate relationship. This was the start of a life of compromise and disregard for my parents' guidance. Without finishing college, Chris and I, at the age of 18 and 19 years old, eloped, got married, and lived at my in-law's house. Soon enough, we started experiencing the consequences of our selfish decisions. We struggled financially, and our relationship was starting to fall apart. On the third year of our marriage, Chris got an opportunity to work abroad for a cruise line where he was away for, for five years. His new lifestyle led him to be unfaithful to me multiple times. I had no guidance. I was living for myself 
and fell into multiple immoral relationships. My wife and my children were the least of my priorities. Living in sin led me to a life that was miserable and meaningless, but still, I continued in my ways. Our marriage was falling apart and our children were deeply affected. It came to a point where I would physically and emotionally abuse my wife and my children. In September of 1998, Chris and I decided that he would stop working abroad, thinking that this would be the solution to our failing marriage. Sadly, things only got worse. We were buried in debt and our fights escalated from verbal to violently physical. There was a time when, he, when we had a fight inside the car and he would slam my head on the car's glass window. There was no longer any love and respect between us, only anger. I became unforgiving and res respectful toward him. Our children were the undeserving victims of my poor choices. Our eldest daughter lost her self-esteem. Our second child at the age of 12 became severely addicted to computer gaming and I would often punish him by physically beating him up. Our third child developed a destructive attitude and had a reclusive behavior, and our youngest daughter lost her love for both of us. For nearly 18 years, our marriage and our family was a total mess. One night during our most serious and physical fight, I decided to leave our house with the intention of leaving my family for another woman. As Chris left, I felt so down and desperate. In the darkness of our house, while our children were asleep, I could hear voices continually telling me to take the life of my children, to kill them one by one and then kill myself. It was a very scary moment in my life. I could not explain it, but looking back, I know that it was the Holy Spirit that protected me and my children. During those dark hours, I was led to pray and listen to worship music. The Lord reminded me that He loves me and that it was only He who could help me. As I lay down on the floor, I cried out to God, prayed to Him, and asked for His forgiveness. I recommitted my life to Jesus Christ that night, and immediately, I felt God's peace in my heart. Meanwhile, as I was in front of my mistress' house, I was trying to call her on the phone, but she could not be reached. After nearly two hours of waiting outside, I decided to return to our house. I was still angry and shouting, but for some reason, I could not explain, my wife was a different person. She was quiet and very gentle. It was like I entered another house. In the days that followed, I intentionally started praying that Chris would grow in a relationship with Jesus. I also decided to start, to start attending church once again and brought my kids with me. We started attending CCF Pasig which eventually became the way for my two older children to know and accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior as well. As God started healing me, I learned to genuinely forgive my husband. It was only by God's grace that I was able to lovingly serve him by preparing his favorite meals, giving him a massage, and welcome him joyfully each time he would come home, even though I knew he was still and faithful to me. In one of the Sunday services, I learned of a CCF couples retreat in Baguio. I prayed and took courage to ask my husband for us to join. We used the little savings we had and signed up. I fervently prayed that we needed God's intervention to save our failing marriage. On the way to Baguio for the retreat, I began to curse my wife. I was angry with her and threatened her throughout the trip. As we reached Baguio and got off the bus, Lisa fell down the steps of the bus all the way to the pavement and I was laughing at her. As the retreat started, we were seated at the back and I could still remember how arrogant I was towards the organizers and volunteers. As I repeatedly criticized the speakers, I complained that this retreat was a total waste of time and money. But as I heard the, the message on forgiveness and how Jesus died to pay for our sins, my sins. I felt God was slowly working in my life. During the session's breakouts, I began to engage with a breakout leader and other participants. And by the grace of God, 
That same afternoon, April of 2008, I surrendered my life to Jesus. I thank God that a week after the retreat, Chris agreed to join a small group with the same volunteer group who organized the couple's retreat. Though Chris attended, he was either eating or mostly asleep during the Bible studies. I was encouraged by our D-group leader that it was okay for as long as Chris kept attending. So I persevered in prayer for my husband. By the grace of God, we kept attending the D-group. And the Lord placed in my heart an unquenchable desire to know Him. He restored my relationship with my loving and faithful wife. I was able to ask for forgiveness for all the things I had done to her. God also, by His grace, slowly restored my relationship with each of my children. I was able to sincerely ask for forgiveness from each of them. As we grew in our love for God, our house became a home. Love and respect became more evident among us. These changes positively impacted our children. Our eldest daughter, Bianca, was able to forgive us and grew up to be an obedient daughter. Patrick, by God's grace, recovered from his computer addiction, and God blessed him with the opportunity to use his computer proficiency as gift for designing. My two younger kids, Miguel and Beyonce, have grown closer to us and more importantly to God. It has been nearly 16 years since I had that personal encounter with Jesus, which transformed my life in many ways I could not imagine. I have fully embraced my calling as a husband, father, and a spiritual leader of my family. Recently, God has given me the opportunity to serve Him as a corporate shepherd for a large organization with the objective of sharing the gospel and helping direct team members' hearts to Jesus. Currently, God has entrusted to me and my wife the privilege of leading our own small group of married couples. Just two weeks ago, we were blessed to serve in a couple's ministry as we served as one of the speakers and facilitators for the inseparable couples retreat where over a hundred marriages were restored and refreshed. Looking at how God has restored our marriage and our family, no words can ever express how grateful I am for the love and forgiveness that God has given to me. We are Chris and Lisa Flores, recipient of God's, God's fervent love, love and faithfulness. To God to be all the glory. glory. Praise God indeed. New identity in Jesus. They know their life is short. They're making the most of their time on earth. And above all, they are recipients and distributors of genuine forgiveness in Jesus. Shall we give God a clap offering once again? Before we pray for them and before we pray at, uh, to, to end our time together, do you believe that with God there are no accidents? Only divine accident? I told you Manuel, remember Manuel? It's his birthday today, correct? Today is also Chris's birthday. So, do you see the resemblance? There were twins separated at birth in the hospital. <laughs> Just joking. Shall we extend our hand of blessing towards Chris and Lisa and their family? Father, how blessed we are when we see um, living exhibits of who you are and how you work in people's lives. How could this couple ever talk about what they shared with us if they did it on their own power? It would never happen. But because of your spirit, because of your love, your compassion, your power, your sovereignty, your mystery, they stand before us today testifying about who you are and who they've become because of you, Lord Jesus and how their trajectory in life has turned in a direction that they never expected, but they will never regret. And indeed, Lord, thank you that in the middle of their story is an amazing, uh, blazing example of your forgiveness to them and your forgiveness exchanged between them and even among the rest of their family. So God, we commit them to you. We thank you for their lives. 
We thank you for what you have in store for them, and we commit them into your loving care. In the name of Jesus, and people rejoice by saying, Amen and Amen. Thank you very much. So as we close our time together in prayer, the question is this. Have you, in this audience or online, have you experienced the fervent love of Jesus? Because you, if you haven't, then you don't have a leg to stand on. You cannot say you have a new identity. You don't care if time is short. And certainly you haven't experienced genuine forgiveness. But today is the day that you can experience that fervent love. Shall we bow our heads together? And if you want to receive that fervent love of Jesus in your life, then tell him. Tell him, Lord Jesus, I am nothing without you. I am so lost and so helpless, even if I sometimes think I'm so good. But Lord Jesus, apart from you and your love, I have no hope, no future, and certainly no hope in being with you in heaven someday. And so, Jesus, I open up my heart to you and I receive you wholeheartedly, in all humility, in faith, not knowing what the future holds, but trusting that you hold my future. I receive you. I surrender myself to you to be my Lord and Savior. Oh, Lord God, we thank you that today we learned about fervent love. We thank you that someday we will meet Peter in heaven and we will know more about what you taught him about love because we have all eternity to talk about it with him. But more importantly, we will see you face to face because of what you did on the cross. We give you back glory, honor, praise, thanksgiving in your name, Jesus. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you all. Good day, CCF family. Welcome to Sunday Fast Track, where you ask real-life questions and we give you biblical truths. I'm Misha Valencia from CCF Communications, and we're here today with our speaker, Pastor Ricky, to answer some of your questions. Good day, Pastor Ricky. Blessed day to you. Thank you for taking the time to answer some of our questions today. Sure. For our first one, considering the brevity of time, how do you strike a balance between pursuing ambitious goals and living as if it's your last day? I guess a good answer to that question would be to make sure you have the right goals in the first place. Uh, the Bible does talk about ambition. But the Bible says our ambition should be to be pleasing to God. So if we make that our ambition and that becomes the motive behind everything that we do, then we know we won't be wasting our time. So I guess it's really recalibrating what our ambition in life is. If our ambitions have anything to do uh, other than pleasing God, we know that we're wasting our time. And a day will come when we will realize we're wasting it, but we won't be able to redeem the time anymore. So if our ambition is to please God in everything we think, say and do and the motives behind them, there is no way we're going to waste our time. Amen. So it's really about making God's ambition for us, our personal ambition. Yeah. So for our next question, in a culture that often <clears throat> encourages holding on to grudges and seeking revenge, how can believers actively promote a culture of forgiveness and love that goes beyond mere words to tangible actions? First, maybe the question said, going beyond mere words, right? Um, I think we need to remember that words are also powerful. Words we speak are also actions. And so when we speak forgiveness or when we say, I'm sorry, those are also very powerful things. And as a matter of fact, those things are hard enough to do, right? Now, I guess the other thing I can say is to ask ourselves how far would we go to give or to seek forgiveness and reconciliation, we need to remember how far Jesus went. There's an old song that says Jesus came from heaven to earth to show the way. That is an incalculable distance that Jesus traveled. 
and his effort and his sacrifice is likewise incalculable. So if Jesus did that for us, then it should help us, along with the power of the Holy Spirit, to reset our minds and ask ourselves, so how far am I willing to go to forgive this person or to seek forgiveness in the same way that Jesus sought forgiveness, not from me, but for me by dying on the cross? Amen. Yes. So it's really more of looking at Jesus' love for us to be able to pass that on to others as well. There. So for our last question, Pastor Ricky, there's a lot of glamour for tolerance in today's context. In view of the Bible's definition of love, do tolerance and love go together or are they in natural opposition to one another? It depends on what you mean by tolerance. Um, God has an intolerance for sin. So we should have no tolerance for that as well. And I'm not saying in, just in other people's lives, in our own lives as well. God's, sin, God's intolerance for sin was so compelling that it caused him to take the form of man and die on the cross. But if by tolerance we mean being understanding, being compassionate to people, uh, understanding where they're coming from, remembering that once upon a time we were in their place before we came to know Jesus, then in that sense they're not in opposition to each other. I think at the end of the day, what we need to ask the Lord is, Lord, give me your eyes and your heart so I can see people the way you see them and I can feel for them the way you feel them. And if I need to say something that may be hurtful to them, it's only because, and we're going back to our definition of love, it's only because it's for their highest good. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we just need to love the way Jesus loves. And that will define what tolerance is and is not. All right. Thank you, Pastor Ricky. So it's right. really looking to Jesus, right, in order to know how to love others. Mm -hmm. Thank you for answering our questions today, Pastor Ricky. But before we go, make sure to catch the latest episode from CCF on air titled Love, Situationships, and the Lulus. This is a special episode for Love Month to help you discover what true love is, what it isn't, and everything in between. Watch it on CCF main YouTube channel or at CCF on air Spotify account. And that's it for Sunday Fast Track. God bless.